Today's main topic is doubt. Now, the interesting thing about doubt for Christians is that doubt is a bad word. Doubt is, uh, it's a four-letter word, even though it's a five-letter word for Christians, because if you realize the opposite of doubt, we would say is faith, and faith is a very good word for Christians. Faith is perhaps the most important word for Christians. When you look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, without faith, It is impossible to please God. There it is. Faith is the essential component of pleasing God. Or in Galatians chapter 3, 26, it says, So in Christ Jesus, you all are children of God through what? Faith. Faith is the most important good word, and therefore doubt is probably the most important bad word for Christians. We tend to believe that doubt is the absolute worst thing that a Christian can do because faith is the best thing. We name our children faith. You've never heard of a Christian child named doubt. It just doesn't show up except for this one guy who we call Doubting Thomas. And I personally like the guy. I think he's got a lot of good things going on in his life. But still, we call him Doubting Thomas. Now, listen, I've had my share of doubts. I've had my own experiences with doubt when I was in Chicago. Some of you know my Chicago story, but uh, I'll just give you a brief bit of it today. I was in Chicago as a pastor of a church there for about five years. When I went to that church, it was obvious to me that God wanted me and my family there. It was obvious that I had been prepared specifically for that experience. I'd gone to an exceptional church When I was being raised, my dad was the pastor of that, so I got to experience that. I went to an exceptional college, and then I went to an exceptional graduate school. I had all of the training that I needed, and I was convinced that God had prepared me well and that he had called me to that specific location. There was just one problem. Nothing in Chicago worked out the way I expected it to. Nothing in Chicago worked out the way I thought it was going to, the way I wanted it to. And at the end of almost five years, we're talking four years and 11 months, at the end of that experience, when we were leaving Chicago finally, I went through a long process of confusion, fear, anger, and yes, doubt. And there were two biggest things that I I had on my mind when it came to doubt. They were question number one, did I misunderstand God? Did God really want me to go somewhere else? Did God really want me to prepare in a different way? Did God want me to do something different while I was there? My question was, did I misunderstand God? But my second question was just as painful. The question was, has God failed me? Did God fail me? You see, on the one hand, I was in control of my activities, and so if I had done the right things but got the wrong results, then maybe it was God who was to blame. Maybe he failed me. And in that moment, I spent about a year wrestling with that doubt. Doubt number one, had I done the wrong thing? Did I misunderstand God? Or doubt number two, had I done the right thing and God didn't come through for me? Perhaps you've been there. Perhaps you've experienced that same dilemma. Perhaps you're experiencing that dilemma right now. You're doubting maybe God put you in the wrong place. Maybe it's his fault. Or maybe you're in the right place, but you're doing the wrong things. After we had been here in Lafayette for three or four years, I went to a conference, a conference of a bunch of pastors. And it just so happened that the then current pastor of the church I had left in Chicago tracked me down. He found me at the conference. He came up to me. He said, are you Jeff Michaels? And I said, yeah, I'm Jeff Michaels. He he said, I just wanted to shake your hand and thank you. I said, what do you mean? He said, if you hadn't done what you did in Chicago, all the good things that are happening now in that church could not have happened. I said, what do you mean? He went on to tell me a bunch of good things that were happening in that church, and he said, there were some things that were going on in the church before I got there that needed to be changed, and if they hadn't been changed by you when you were there, all the good things that are going on now could not be happening. He said, Jeff, I just wanted to thank you for making my job so much easier. And I tell you, at that moment, I just felt an incredible wave of relief. But I also learned a new lesson. 
You see, the new lesson that I had learned was that God had me in Chicago not to do my will, but to do his will. God had me in Chicago doing what I was doing and where I was, not because of my plans, but because of his. See, it's not that I needed to doubt God, was I doing the right thing or the wrong thing. It was clear to me at the time that I was doing what he had asked me to do. And it wasn't, God, have you given up on me? It was a different question entirely. God, what are you really up to? You see, God had me where I was, not for my plans, but for his. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in that moment? We interviewed um, Eric and Carrie earlier today, and I, I just wanted to highlight for you something that they said. They said in that interview that they were facing the same kind of doubts, the same kinds of questions. Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I experiencing what I'm supposed to be experiencing? And you know what? As they were working on that question, they had no answer. They had no answer at all. But then later on, God shows up. Eric quit one job to pursue an education. And then in the midst of that, he gets a job at Walmart questioning everything, wondering, am I supposed to be doing this? Is this what God really wants for me? But then this coronavirus thing hits, and lo and behold, he he graduates, and lo and behold, his former company laid off all of their employees, including the ones that had the job that he had, and as a result of his experience at Walmart, he got a great job now. So here's the deal. God revealed to Eric and to Carrie that his journey through this detour was not a, oh God, when are you going to bring me back? It was... God, you are preparing me for something new. See, I believe God had Eric doing exactly what he was doing, not for Eric's reasons, but for God's reasons. Here's the truth for us. It's easy at the ends. When we're beginning a new venture or when we are learning God's final results of the thing that he had been planning all along, it's easy at the ends, but it's hard in the middle. See, that's where we doubt Today I want to share with you three kinds of doubt and how to deal with them. Doubt number one is what I call lack of confidence in a fact. It's simple. It's here's a statement of fact and I don't really believe it or I don't know if I believe it or or I don't have full confidence in it. Perhaps you've experienced this kind of doubt before in your life. Doubt like did God really create the world? Did God create the world the way it seems Genesis describes it? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Or maybe is the Bible really God's word? Those are some of the things that perhaps you've experienced doubt over. And those are just simple doubts over facts. Another way of talking about it is skepticism. And here's the truth. I believe that skepticism like that is good if we change the question. See, the question we want to ask is, did God really? But the question I think we should ask is, what is the evidence for this claim? Let me show you what I mean. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 16, it says this, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Peter says this very clearly. He says, you are going to be challenged in the things you believe. And when you get that challenge, you should be able to give a good, gentle, and accurate answer for the reason, for the hope that you have. Listen, a lot of times Christians take this approach when it comes to facts. They will say, hey, listen, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. And I want to encourage you, go ahead and have some skepticism. Go ahead and have some doubts. Your question should be not, did God really, but what is the evidence for this claim? What does the Bible actually say? Who in the Bible says it? In what context do they say it? And does Jesus himself ever actually talk about it? You see, I want to encourage you to drive yourself back into scriptures. It is not doubt to ask yourself the question, 
what does it really say? What does it really mean? What is the real evidence? So I told you I was going to give you three kinds of doubt. The first kind of doubt, I don't even really consider it doubt the way Christians tend to talk about doubt. I consider it skepticism or a lack of confidence in a fact. And I want you to have a lack of confidence in your facts because I want you to drive yourself back into God's word and ask yourself repeatedly, what is the reason for this hope? But doubt number two. Maybe it's also not a real doubt, but let's just talk about it. Doubt number two, I call a lack of confidence in a prayer. This is something that's kind of a sneaky one for Christians, because a lot of Christians will accuse you of being a person of doubt if you've prayed for something and you don't display confidence in the results of your prayer. This happens a lot of times in a number of church contexts, but the best way I can explain it to you is by giving you an illustration. I have a friend. His name was Brad Bush. He passed away a number of years ago. But I knew him before then. And he was definitely a part of a church culture where they believed that in order for you to receive what you had prayed for, you had to have utter confidence in that prayer. Well, Brad was a a great pastor in town. He did a number of phenomenal things to improve the spiritual condition of people here in this community, and I am incredibly grateful to God for putting Brad Bush in our midst. But when he was diagnosed as having a brain tumor, a bunch of people got together around him and they prayed for him. And they prayed for his healing. And I was in a number of contexts where I heard people use this phrase, they were believing God for Brad's healing. They were believing God for his healing. There were some people who even had visions that Brad would be completely healed and completely restored. But he died. So there are some Christians who would say the lack of Brad's healing was proof of the lack of faith. He wasn't healed because there was some kind of doubt. And listen, there are a lot of Bible verses that uh, indicate we have been given promises by God that he will answer our prayers. If we pray according to his will, he will hear us, he will answer us. And I could quote a number of different passages that on the surface look like blanket promises that when you pray for something, you are supposed to hang on to, with, hang on to that prayer with confidence. And you're supposed to claim it. You're supposed to believe it. You're supposed to say this prayer will happen. There's only one problem. The Bible doesn't support that. You see, there's this passage in James. I mean, there are passages you could take out of context that support it out of context, but the Bible as a whole doesn't support it. Let me show show you this passage from James chapter 4. It says, you do not have because you do not ask God. Well, see, there you go. We didn't ask God, and so that's why we don't have no. Keep reading. He says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. See, someone might accuse you that it's doubt when you prayed for something and don't expect it to come. I don't believe so. I don't call that doubt. I call that a lack of confidence in your prayers. And you should have a lack of confidence in your prayers because you should have a lack of confidence in your motives. And you're saying, oh, no, 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 I've got great motives. My motives aren't for my own pleasure. My motives are pure. Well, Let me show you what Proverbs has to say about that. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2 says, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. I don't know what your motives are, and I don't know what my motives are. I know a little bit of what my motives are. I know a little bit of what Brad's motives were. I know a little bit of what the people in Brad's lives' motives were. But I'll just tell you, God can get glory, and great things can happen when one of his saints goes to heaven. And God can get glory and great things can happen when one of his saints stays on earth. And God can get glory and great things can happen when one of his saints goes through a hard time and then is delivered from that hard time. And God can get glory and great things can happen when God chooses which of those three options he wants. We pray for things, and then we lack the confidence that our prayer is going to come true. And I'm okay with that, and you should be okay with that. 
because your motives might not be entirely purely what God wants. And so that's one of the reasons why Jesus would always say, pray in my name. That's one of the reasons why Jesus would say, whatever you ask in my name will be done. Ask anything according to my will and it will be done. See, Jesus himself, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, prayed a prayer and he said, Father, if you would, I would like it for you to remove from me this thing I'm about to go through. But nevertheless, not my will Yours be done. That's why Jesus says in the prayer we call the Lord's Prayer, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen, I want to encourage you. If you've ever had face, if you've ever faced doubt with regard to your prayers, great. That's a good doubt to have. It's just simply you need to ask a better question. Not, God, why won't you answer my prayer? The better question is, what are my motives in asking? for this thing. So here's the deal. I think we all need more doubt. We need to pray fervently, but still question our motives. And we need to hold convictions over our beliefs, but also pursue answers. But there's a third kind of doubt. And this is the real one. It's the kind of doubt I want you to remove from your life entirely. It's the kind of doubt that I think needs to be eradicated from your life. It's lack of of confidence in God. See, you can doubt all the other things, but I don't ever want you to doubt this one statement. A good God is in control. A good God is in control. I want to take you to a passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 14. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to grab it. Look it up with me. Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. This is a passage we could have looked at last week when we were talking about fear, but we're going to look at it it today. It says this, Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Once again, this is right on the heels of Jesus feeding 5,000 people. He goes up onto a mountainside to pray. He dismisses the crowd. He dismisses the disciples to cross the lake. It says this in verse 23. After Jesus had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, as I said, we could have talked about this last week when we were dealing with fear. Twice in this passage, we're told about fear. Once, we can assume they were afraid. So here they are. They're rowing. They're buffeted by the wind and the waves. They're having a hard time rowing. They're probably afraid then, even though it doesn't say it. But then when Jesus goes walking to them on the water, it says they are terrified. They thought they saw a ghost. They thought they were all going to die because somehow an angel of God or a ghost or a spirit was going to come and get them. And so they were terrified. And then Peter... He gets out of the boat, and then we are told that he is afraid. But Jesus didn't accuse Peter of fear, did he? Did you see what Jesus said about Peter? Jesus said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? See, even though we are told Peter was afraid, and even though we are told the disciples were afraid, Jesus doesn't accuse them of fear. Jesus accuses Peter of lack of faith or doubt. What did Jesus mean by doubt? 
You know, when I was a kid, I remember this story uh, was being told to me with a flannel graph or Sunday school environments. You've probably experienced something along those lines. But it always went like this. The story always went like this. Here's Jesus walking to them on the water, and walking on the water, for crying out loud, that's an amazing feat. Jesus is walking to them on the water, and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out to you on the water. And then little flannel graph Peter gets out of the boat, and he walks along the water. And then, this was my favorite part of the flannel graph story, because there were always these waves, you know, that were on the flannel graph. And then Peter would be behind the waves, and here's Jesus standing on top of the waves, and then this, the Sunday school teacher would take the paper Peter, and he would say, when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink, and then they would pull Peter down under the waves. I loved that. It was so visual. I loved it. They would pull Peter underneath the waves, and then he would cry out, Jesus, save me. And then the teacher would make the moral point of the story. Peter began to sink because he took his eyes off of Jesus. Listen, I've preached that before. I've told people that before. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and put his eyes on the waves, and that's when Peter began to sink. But there's just one problem with that. You see, that put in my head this idea of magical eye contact. There's this scene in the first Harry Potter movie where Harry is on a broomstick and he's flying around doing his thing, you know, in this uh, Quidditch game. If you're familiar with Harry Potter, then you understand these things. If you're not, don't worry about it. He's flying around on a broomstick and then the scene all of a sudden changes as we realize that Harry is under a magic spell. And you, the viewer, the audience, begins to realize that the reason he's under a magic spell is that the evil Professor Snape has been maintaining eye contact on Harry's broom. And they solve the problem when Hermione, the hero, is able to convince Snape to avert his eyes from Harry's broom. And once the evil person gets his eye contact broken from the broom, then Harry is fine after that point in time. And I had the same picture in my head when it came to Peter and Jesus. As long as Peter had his eyes on Jesus, the magic of walking on the water remained the same. But Jesus doesn't accuse Peter of taking his eyes off of him. Jesus doesn't accuse Peter of paying attention to the waves. Jesus accuses Peter of doubt. How should we understand this? Here you go. I think there are two verses that I want to point out to you to give you a good picture of this. Verse 28. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Let me just summarize that for you. I'll give you a quick summary. Because of Jesus, I'm okay. Peter looks at Jesus. He says, because of Jesus, I'm okay. If that's really you, Jesus, then you can tell me anything and I'm going to do it. Even walking on the water and I'll do it. It doesn't matter. As long as that's Jesus, I'm okay. Peter says, because of Jesus, I'm okay. But now, let me take you to the next verse that I want to point you to. It's verse 30. It says, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. There's still a lingering bit of, because of Jesus, I'm okay, because his last line is, Lord, save me. But it's changed. It's now because of Jesus, I will be okay if Jesus gets involved. Do you see that? That's a turn that a lot of us make. Because of Jesus, I will be okay if he gets involved. And then we ask ourselves all these questions. Is Jesus going to be involved? How am I going to be okay? But there's something else that happened before Peter says, Lord, save me. And it's when he looked at the wind, when he saw the waves. It goes like this. Because of the wind, I'm not okay. The phrase was, because of Jesus, I'm okay. Now it's because of the wind, I'm not okay. And then I'll need Jesus to come in and rescue me. But what changed? The thing that changed in those two verses is that Peter went from a place of faith, because of Jesus I'm okay, to a place where now the wind wins, where now the wind is in control. Faith says Jesus is in control, 
Peter, at this moment, says, oh, no, no, the wind is in control. Now I need Jesus to save me from the wind because the wind is in control. Listen, this shouldn't even be called faith. It's just common sense. It's just common sense because, listen, the one who's standing on the water is the one who's really in charge. Are the wind and the waves in charge? Or is the one who's standing on the water in charge? I think it's just common sense. The waves aren't in charge. It's the person walking on the waves that's in charge. And so why in the world would Peter ever say, because of the wind, I'm no longer okay? You see, the doubt shows up when Peter says, I was okay simply because of Jesus. Now I'll only be okay if Jesus does something more. The doubt is who is really in control. How often does God have to prove to his people that he is really in control before they'll finally get it? How often does God have to throw you a curveball and then prove to you that he was in charge of it the whole time before you will get it? What about you? Do you doubt? Listen, what threatens me is nothing compared to God. This virus, nothing compared to God. This environment where church is weird is nothing compared to God. Your unemployment or your fears about unemployment are nothing compared to God. What threatens me cannot compare to God. And guess what? That's a good thing. I want a God who is bigger than all the things that threaten me. And then on top of that, my hardship and the things that I go through. That's just merely God giving me the opportunity to grow through. God is bringing hardship my way sometimes so that he can also give me his strength, so that I can also become a better person. That's why James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many, many kinds because that will produce in you perseverance leading to maturity. That is why we can say these things are good even when they're hard. Where are you today? Are you facing doubt? Are you facing doubt about your prayers? That's a good thing. Are you facing doubt about your facts? That's a good thing. Both of those things should drive us more to understand what God is really all about in his word. But do you doubt this final thing, that God's in charge and that he's good? Listen, I just want to encourage you, don't ever let yourself doubt this one truth. A good God is in control. Look at Romans 8, 28 with me. One of the most famous passages. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. There is a good God, and he is definitely in control. He is the one who walks on water. He's the one who raises the dead. He is the one who made the water. He is the one who invented life. A good God is in control. Listen, this week, I think it's fine for you to question your facts. That's a good doubt. I think it's fine for you to question your motives. That's a good doubt. But never, ever, ever doubt that a good God is in control.